we'll have someone else on the slides and I'll just narrate through them. Okay, we need one more city council person to put a camera on. Um, Mr. Yeah, Mr. McCoy, are you there? I just don't want to start without a quorum. And Ms. Miller Anderson, could you, one of you, Mr. McCoy, put your camera on? There we go. I uh, call to order the City Council Workshop on the Special Preservation Ordinance, uh, August 21st. The time is 6.08 p.m., Madam Clerk. Mayor Ronnie Felder. Chairperson Julia Botel. Here. Chair Pro Tem Douglas Lawson. Here. Councilperson Tradrick McCoy. Councilperson Here. Councilperson Kachamba Miller Anderson. Present. Councilperson Shirley Lanier. Deputy City Manager Elizabeth McBride. Here. City Clerk Claudine Anthony is present. City Attorney Don Wynn here. You may proceed. Thank you. We'll have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilman McCoy. <laughs> to the flag of the United States to the Republic for which, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we have <coughs> item. Madam Clerk, could you read the item? Madam Chair, prior to, I can, I can barely hear you, Madam Chair. You sound like you're in a... I'm Let a me, you know what, I'll do this. While you're doing that, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, we normally do not do public comments for our workshop. However, the Office of the City Clerk has received two public comments for this workshop um, this evening. I need to know what's the pleasure of the board as to whether or not they will want to hear these public comments. Well, it, uh, if there's only two, I think it's not a harmful thing. Up to me, if it was up to me, I would say yes, but do we have have any other opinions on that matter, Mr. Lawson? Madam Chair, I wouldn't want to start a precedence of accepting public comments with this workshop um, because if we do that now, moving forward, it's going to be requested. So okay. I think we should stay consistent with you know, my opinion. Okay. Looks like Councilwoman Miller Anderson is agreeing with that, Mr. McCoy. Truly really a preference. I mean, we can decide, and obviously, this isn't a voting meeting. So um, I'm just asking your opinion, sir. But I mean, I, I would like to hear the public comments. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know to provide some context to something that's going to be presented, but you know, it's all falls into the purpose. Even though we're not, something we typically don't do, I, I mean, we're giving the public the right to participate. I don't see what's wrong with that. Okay, since it's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear them, Madam Clerk. They're probably very, very short. Uh, go ahead then, Madam Clerk, and, and read the, read the, um, ordinance and then if you read the public comments we get that out of the way madam chair i don't believe you all adopted the agenda oh i'm sorry thank you uh could we have a motion to adopt the agenda please so moved thank you and yes. someone's thank you madam clerk councilperson mccoy yes councilperson miller anderson yes pro tem lawson yes to, yes. Question. Mr. McCoy. So looking at the agenda, I, I don't know why we would need to read the, it, it. It starts off by saying an ordinance of the city council. We're not actually taking action on this. So I sense that procedurally we would just say that to the workshop regarding this, but there's no need to read the actual ordinance language because we're not <laughs> taking any action. That's fine. Uh, Madam uh, Attorney, we don't have to read it, do we, the whole thing? We'll say I mean, it's discussion and deliberation by the council on the ordinance. At least I would recommend that we read the subject matter of the ordinance, the fact that it's a special preservation ordinance number 4147. Um, well, I mean, reading, even reading the, the, the title takes less than one minute. It's on the well, agenda. But I think what also needs to be 
clear that this is not just more or less session. So, I mean, for it to be placed under deliberation, I just want to make sure that we don't some kind of way us preemptively taking any so. Right, you're not allowed to right. take action. We're not allowed to because it's not a, right. it's not a meeting, it's a workshop. So right. we're not taking any action, that's definite. But thank you, Mr. McCoy, for raising that issue. We, it won't be deliberation, it's just discussion. And I think we all know what the ordinance is and it's here in writing if anybody wants to refer to it. Ms. Miller Anderson. But I think going forward though, um, Ms. McCoy is right. I mean, it, typically our workshops don't have them listed as that. And I do yeah. not believe we even um, take a motion on it. We don't make motions typically during workshops. So that is a little concerning. Yeah, we, I don't yeah. think we, we didn't make any motion yet on this. Did someone just do it? I no, thought that somebody was the, did. That was the agenda. Just oh, the agenda. okay. Yeah, yeah. So okay. We're not gonna, All right. No, we're not going to make a motion on this. And, and I've actually crossed out on my copy this line that says deliberation. So you all can do the same if you like because we're not. Yeah, but just for the record, but for yeah. the record, though, it needs to be. Right. Right. This is not. We will not be deliberating. This is a workshop for informational purposes only. Okay. So, um, I'll read the, the, the is about ordinance number. Let's read the very first, the very beginning, uh, per Ms. Wynn's instruction. Madam Chair, members of the board, members of the public that are listening, tonight's workshop is for information, informational purposes only regarding ordinance number 4147, which is concerning amending chapter 31 of the city's code of ordinances. Thank and you. all those that we do not normally do public comments during our workshop, the board has, um, decision has been made to um, hear public comment, which I will do at this particular time. And our first public comment comes from email address sp500trda at yahoo.com. Please attach the following as my public comment for this meeting. The Attorney General stated in an, in an informal opinion on May 19, 1987 to the City Attorney for the City of St. Augustine, Florida, that workshops should allow for public comment. This workshop should have been open for public comment because it is the public that is paying the bills for the council person's salary and expenses, not the other way around. Friday night is a time for high school sports and family, along with a sacred time for members of the Jewish faith and some Christian religions. It is disgusting that the chairperson and city manager would hold this meeting on a Friday night while also limiting public participation while illegally pushing through a rezoning that is already void as a matter of law. I received a call this morning from the Florida Commission on Ethics in Tallahassee. I filed a complaint against Julia Botel last spring and their investigation has dug into many additional areas beyond those that were the subject of my complaint. The Commission on, on Ethics set the Botel investigation for a public hearing before the Commission on September 11th. This hearing being been delayed until October 23rd at 10 o'clock a.m. based on a request from Botel's criminal attorney. The evidence is irrefutable that Botel has illegally used city resources for private purposes to include political opposition Excuse me, uh, Madam Clerk, this is not a public comment. I'm sorry, Ms. Wynn, go ahead. She has to read the public comment. You all have said that you wanted to read it and she, okay. she needs to just well, read it okay, for the I'm three sorry. minutes. You were Thank shaking you. your head. Right. One second, could, could, could Mr. Andrew t um, mute his microphone? Because I think that's him typing or somebody. Thank you. The evidence, is, okay. the evidence is irrefutable that Botel has illegally used city resources for private purposes to include political opposition campaigns. I am cautiously optimistic that the Commission on Ethics will recommend that their investigative findings be transferred to prosecutors for consideration of criminal charges. This is just one more reason why Botel is unfit to be an elected official in the city, and it is an ongoing disgrace that Botel is the council chairperson. Please, be, oh, and Madam Chair, that ends that public comment. Thank you. 
The following public comment comes from, and that comment was from Fane Lozman. This comment comes from the email address of barkay at gtlaw.com. Dear city clerk, I understand that the city of Riviera Beach may not allow public comment at workshop, but I want to bring to your attention the informal attorney, uh, attorney general opinion dated May 19th, 1987 to the city attorney of the city of St. Augustine in which the attorney general noted that a workshop meeting of the city of St. Augustine at which official business is discussed is subject to the Sunshine Law and should provide for public input. Accordingly, on behalf of Halo Development LLC, Fang Lozman and Renegade Trust Number Two, I am attaching a le letter regarding Special Preservation Zoning District Ordinance, Ordinance 4122 in parentheses, that I request be read into the record of the workshop tonight and incorporated into the administrative record agenda packet. Marsh and the letter development LLC, Halo in parentheses, Fane Lozman and Renegade Trust number two, the owners of real property located within the geographic area of the proposed special preservation zoning district in parentheses, ordinance 4122 or ordinance close parentheses, and more particularly described in exhibit A of this letter. As you have been apprised previously by letter, together, Halo, Fane Lozman, and Renegade Trust 2, collectively in parentheses, owners, close parentheses, own approximately 51 acres of land, which accounts for 20% or more of the area of the lots included in such proposed change. Parentheses to the Special Preservation Zoning District, close parentheses, City of Riviera Beach Code, Section 31-5, Paranth 2018. By letter dated June 17, 2020, the owners notified the City Council of the extent of their ownership and the fact that owners opposed the ordinance. The City Clerk read the owner's letter of, of, of objection into the record at the first reading of the Special Preservation District Ordinance on July 8, 2020. The City Council considered and voted on the proposed Special Preservation District Ordinance at the public hearing on July 8, 2020. Two of the five city council members voted against the proposed ordinance, which means that the ordinance failed to garner the favorable vote of three-fourths, 75% in brackets of the city council required by section 31-5 of the city code. Madam Chair, that is not the end of the public comment. However, the three minutes is up and will be made a part of the record. That concludes public comment. Thank you. And now, uh, Madam Assistant City Manager, will you be presenting or will Mr. Sermons be presenting the uh, item? Mr. Sermons, will you be presenting? Yes, Mr. Sermons will be presenting tonight, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and you give me just a moment to get the slideshow up. All right. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the council. I am Clarence Herman, Director of Development Services, and I have the pleasure of uh, presenting uh, the content of tonight's workshop uh, presentation to you. And uh, you are probably um, familiar, but um, I will take you the first uh, several slides to um, just kind of be a refresher to the, uh, the, the content of this ordinance. And then the uh, balance of the slides will be dedicated to discussing the additional information that was requested from council during the um, first hearing. So um, before you is the, uh, the language of uh, the ordinance. Uh, next slide, please. Ordinance number 4147, the city comprehensive plan. Um, the 
future land use element of it provide for special preservation future land use designation. Um, however, the city's uh, zoning code um, does not provide for that same land use designation. Um, therefore, they are not in uh, conformance. Uh, next slide, please. The city's comprehensive plan provides specific provisions for special preservation or areas of the city. The same land area having a special preservation future land use designation on our comprehensive plan, uh, future land use map has an R5 single family residential zoning designation on the city zoning map. Per Florida statute, uh, the city zoning map must be compatible uh, with the future land use map. To, accomplish, to accomplish the state the required state compatibility, compatibility, the city, the city must, create must create a special, special preservation zoning designation and amend the zoning map accordingly. Next slide, please. So uh, ordinance 4147 will accomplish three things. The first would be to create the SP or special preservation zoning district. And it will mirror the requirements of the city's comprehensive plan future land use element. The second item that this ordinance will accomplish is to amend the city zoning map by incorporating the SP special preservation zoning district in the city's uh, zoning map which will mirror the special preservation future land use area of the city's future land use uh, plan map. And the third thing this ordinance will accomplish is to sunset the current special preservation and submerged lands moratorium, which was initially adopted by ordinance uh, 4133 and extended by uh, two subsequent orders. Next slide, please. Uh, before you, you see the future land use map of the city and the uh, current designations on it. And uh, to the top right of the map, you see the area in question in green. Uh, next slide, please. And the subject area is highlighted on the current slide. Next slide, please. And here is a, um, a zoomed in uh, depiction of the subject area. Next slide, please. Now this image is of the city's zoning map. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that this subject area is not consistently zoned uh, with the future land use map, which puts the city um, out of conformance with the state statute that requires them to um, be consistent. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of zoning, uh, to the left on this image, you'll see that it is currently uh, zoned as R5 residential. This proposed amendment uh, would change the zoning of this area to SP or special preservation. Next slide, please. Uh, the graphic here um, shows the hierarchy of land use authority for uh, local regulation. Um, according to state statute, uh, the comprehensive plan is the governing document. Um, so anytime a land use decision is made um, by the city or staff, um, they have to first be in conformance with the comprehensive plan. It is the highest um, governing document of the city. Next are land development codes, which would be our uh, zoning map and other codes that uh, regulate uh, development on different uh, properties. And then finally, the third tier are development orders, such as uh, site plan approval, zoning applications, permits, things of that nature. Um, are st site specific, um, but those are the uh, lowest order of uh, regulations uh, for land use authority uh, vested by into the city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this next slide just highlights uh, the requirements by the state, and I'll just uh, reiterate the bottom portion. Um, and it speaks to if there's ever a situation as we are in as a city where the comprehensive plan and the zoning map or, or other development orders are not in con, uh, are not consistent that the comprehensive plan is the governing document uh, that controls and uh, that's what this uh, slide is communicating and, and this is information that uh, Mr. Bauman communicated to council during uh, the previous hearing and uh, other workshops. Next slide please. Uh, the slide here uh, lists uh, several examples of development orders that the city um, is vested to uh, issue to applicants. And those include things, again, like building permits, zoning permits, special exceptions.
touches, but again, these are site specific development um, orders that uh, that can be issued, but they are required to be um, in consistency uh, first with the city's uh, comprehensive plan, then zoning, um, and then other any other regulation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this looks. This slide shows the um, allowable densities based on our future land use map. This is in our comprehensive plan. Uh, the table to the right shows the different future land use categories. At the very bottom and highlighted is the special preservation ordinance. Uh, I'm sorry, the special preservation of future land use designation. Um, as you can see, it allows a floor area ratio or a density of 0.0. .0. Um, uh, that is important to point out because uh, rezoning this uh, land does not confer any additional development rights uh, on the landowners there, nor does it take away any development rights uh, because it's already zoned, I'm sorry, it's already designated as special preservation in our future land use uh, map. And as you can see, special preservation has an allowable uh, floor area ratio of 0.0. .0. Um, and to my knowledge, there is only uh, one exception um, in this area to uh, the special preservation density. Next slide, please. Um, so just a, a brief recap of um, the, the matriculation of this ordinance uh, back in uh, September, October, 2019, um, during council workshop was the first time uh, that this was uh, discussed uh, with council and staff. Uh, on May 28th, the city's planning and zoning board unanimously recommended approval of this ordinance. And then on July 8th, 2020, uh, city staff provided their recommendation to council uh, to approve the subject ordinance and it, it, it did uh, pass the first reading. Um, at that same uh, council meeting, the staff was requested to provide additional research as to um, uh, the interest of confirming actual uh, wetlands in this area to ensure we were um, in fact pr protecting um, lands that are stated in the comprehensive plan as uh, sensitive and um, a high priority of the city and uh, that is what the remainder of the slides will um, will show what that research search has been since then uh, next slide please so this map here is an excerpt from the comprehensive plan. It is figure C2, um, which highlights beaches, estuary systems, and wetlands. Um, this map is from the National Wetland Inventory. And uh, in the uh, greenish color there, you can see um, it uh, depicts estu estuarine and marine wetlands. Um, and the subject area in the uh, top right uh, corner of the screen um, shows that greenish color, which indicates that the National Wetland Inventory uh, designates this area as uh, wetlands. Next slide, please. Um, this next um, document um, was also uh, covered in our research. This is the Palm Beach County Engineering Service Survey. Um, it was conducted in 1996 uh, for, uh, for uh, their activities. Um, there is an ERM line that is um, highlighted in yellow on the picture. I know it's not legible, but I could um, provide the, uh, a PDF of it um, if necessary. Um, but it does show um, the field survey uh, where they uh, did a field um, survey to determine what the um, wetland delineation line in this area would be. And you can see um, that it, it uh, aligns the coast of just about everything um, north of um, Pine Point and um, west of um, Ocean Drive. Next slide, please. So in the, addition to um, the aforementioned research that um, we have looked into since the first hearing, uh, there was also a, um, a study commissioned by the city of uh, Secos, um, which is a Syriax environmental consulting, uh, uh, forgot what the S stands for. <laughs> Um, but we uh, commissioned this company to uh, conduct the study of the subject area to uh, verify that they, there is or is not uh, wetlands in this area. Um, as a part of their review, uh, they looked at the following resources, um, satellite imagery uh, from uh, Google Earth. They looked at the Lake Worth Lagoon Management Plan, the Lake Worth Lagoon Initiative Management Plan, Palm Beach County Environmental Resource Management, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, seagrass and mangrove ha habitat GIS databases, Florida Department of Environmental Protection MapDirect, 
um, Florida Department of Environmental Protection statewide ecosystem assessment of coastal and aquatic resources, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service information for planning and consultation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service critical habitat map for the Florida manatee, marine biodiversity biodiversity observation network data, portal manatee synoptic survey data, <laughs> and the National Marine Fisheries Service essential fish habitat uh, mapper. Um, it, again, those are the different documents and resources and databases um, that the consultant looked at to evaluate the uh, presence or absence of wetlands in this area. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is the conclusion of their study, and um, I'll bring to your attention the uh, first paragraph of their conclusion. Um, quote, uh, conclusion based on the results of this assessment, the natural resources slash wetlands present within the study area include extensive seagrass beds with adjacent fringed mangroves. These wetlands are significant habitat and are used by the state and federally protected species, including the federally protected manatee, small tooth sawfish, and green sea turtle as well as many other wildlife species. They are also um, EFH, a significant resource protected by uh, the National Marine Fisheries, uh, uh, I forgot what the S stands for again. Um, again, uh, again, that's the, uh, the, the portion of their uh, conclusion that relates to uh, their finding that um, there are wetland uh, resources present uh, in the subject area. Next slide, please. And uh, that concludes the uh, research conducted since the first hearing of this reading. Uh, myself, um, Assistant Director Jeff Gagnon, uh, Attorney uh, Andrew Bauman, uh, and uh, the rest of uh, city legal staff are present uh, to answer any questions that council may have related to this information. Thank you, Mr. Sermons. Do we have questions from council? Mr. Lawson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Mr. Sermons, has there um, been any other wetlands or environmental sensitive lands that was impacted by development um, within the last decade in the city? Um, I'm not sure I follow the question. Has any development taken place on environment, environmentally sensitive land in the city? Yes. I can't answer that uh, definitively. Um, I know that there have been some code uh, violation cases in the subject area um, as of recent. Um, uh, those are two that I'm aware of, but beyond that, I, I can't be certain. Okay. Um, okay. I believe that from my understanding, that the city marina that was developed years ago, that affected the seagrass um, and impacted seagrass. So I would definitely want you to take a look at that for me. Um, I believe there's a development that is behind the fire station that it affected some wetlands. So if you could just research that for us, because right now my concern is that what is the difference? between this land and the other wetlands in the last 10 years. That's my first concern because my biggest issue is that I want to preserve this lagoon. I would like for us to keep it. And if the city could buy all of this land, I would want us to purchase the land to preserve it. The issue is, is I'm no longer allowing for anyone to come in and file a lawsuit and have the ability to possibly win against our city. So I want to make sure that we've covered every aspect possible, crossed every T we can, dotted every I. And if I can't have answers for every single one of these questions and concerns I have, I cannot support this ordinance. So I really want to know if you could research for me, if someone can bring to the table um, prior to this next reading, what wetlands have been affected and what's the difference? That's my first concern. My second concern is going to be, I took some notes, um, land use. Why has this been misaligned for so long? Why is the fact that we're changing this now? What is the what is the issue? What is the rush? If this is such a priority that this has to be a state required compatible situation that we have to address, 
why has it been misaligned for so many years? I'm not, I can't I'm sure, I'm sure. that question. Um, I'm not sure. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Sermons, I know that you've, you've just been here for a few months. So these are just questions that I would like for uh, Ms. McBride and yourself to take back um, to actually have prepared and, and available for me because I'm not sure if you, either you or Mr. Bowman could answer these tonight. But if this can be addressed so that we can kind of address some of these concerns with um, myself and my colleagues, I don't want to be liable and sitting in another lawsuit where five, six, seven years down the line, we're paying um, paying out taxpayer dollars. So these are some major issues that we currently have. Go ahead, Ms. Wynn. What well, I currently have. Um, yes, my understanding, and Mr. Bauman can jump in, is that this happens all the time in many jurisdictions. Sometimes things just get left out. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't intentional, um, but the state does require that they be aligned and that they be consistent. And so that's what we're doing now. Okay. And Mr. Um, Bauman, if you want to add, Sure. Um, if I can add to that, um, it is true that this is not unusual for comprehensive plans to get changed in the zoning code to have some misalignment here or there, particularly particularly when you change a comprehensive plan and it may have effect on multiple provisions of the code and they're not all caught at the same time. In this particular instance, I can tell you that um, um, when we were uh, engaged by the city uh, to uh, first respond to the, the issues that were raised in connection with some of the properties in this area, um, this was something that we had ident that we identified to the city. Um, I can't really speak to prior to our engagement, which was really uh, um, you know a, a couple of years ago um, that, it was that it was first identified to the city that, hey, are you aware that your zoning code does not match your comprehensive plan? Um, what has what has happened in the more recent past has been um, a series of um, either applications or statements, um, uh, many of them public, made to uh, the city the city council, prior city councils in the very recent past, um, uh, stating that certain things are allowed because the zoning code says this. Whereas we all know that the comprehensive plan says something else. So, so uh, while this was identified, it was never directly um, an issue that the city looked at having to address until it was essentially put before them in something that they had to deal with. One, I guess uh, one thing I can state now in terms of your question of what's the difference between the other parcels and these is this is these parcels in question for this ordinance are the only ones in the city that our comprehensive plan ordinance has designated as a special preservation uh, area. Um, other places that could have been um, um, determined to be wetlands based on studies uh, were not um, identified by our comprehensive plan as areas that we uh, want to protect as a city um, and, and be designated as those uh, future land uses um, by an ordinance that governs the, the city. So this is the only uh, such place uh, in the city and that's the, the major difference between this and any other wetlands that may have been um, developed for whatever the reasons may have been uh, in other places in the city. Okay. And um, Mr. Sermons, I see that, uh, I just noticed that Mr. Gagnon's on the line. Is this something that he may be able to answer the first two questions um, since he's been here for a number of years? It, um, Mr. Gagnon, if you have anything to add, I, I do know that this uh, future land use uh, designation does predate his time with the city as well. So. Hey there, sorry about that. I was having no technical worries. difficulties for a second. Um, I think that uh, to your first question, as far as 
the difference in development patterns or locations. I think that Director Sermon was uh, spot on in his response as far as saying that um, if there has been any other development that could have impacted any sort of wetland area, it would not have been uh, impacting any special preservation future land use area. Um, so I know in the conversation there is a lot of association with the special preservation future land use area with uh, the city's existing wetland ordinance, but they are separate and apart from one another. And um, the ordinance that we're discussing uh, and proposing is really uh, something that won't have a direct impact on the wetland ordinance that's already existing. It will really just uh, provide that zoning designation so we can be consistent with our future land use map. Okay. And uh, could you repeat the second question, please, sir? Um, I believe if there was any land over the last uh, 10 years or any wetlands that have been impacted um, with development. Um, uh, there, there's definitely has been some impact to sensitive land. Um, really anything that's developing or redeveloping along the, uh, the barrier island on Singer Island um, has to deal with multiple environmental uh, reviewing agencies, especially anything that could impact the dune area. Um, mm -hmm. It may not be a direct impact to wetlands. Um, I know that uh, there was some language or discussion associated with the Harbor Point redevelopment, which is the area that's just east of uh, mm -hmm. the fire station on Singer Island that um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, I do believe there was some discussion on how to manage some of the wetland impacts for that project as well. So uh, perhaps we can provide that information uh, under a separate cover to city council. If we could take a look at that, and um, I believe there was wetlands at the marina docks as well. So if we could take a look at those just to kind of get some information um, and just provide some cover for council. Um, uh, next question. Um, the value of the land. Um, this may be either for Ms. McBride or Ms. Wynn. How can we assess the value of these wetlands? Um, I'm sorry, that the submerged land uh, that is being directly affected. Is it possible for us to look into um, acquiring an appraisal to determine if we can get a, a minimal value for these lands in the event that we decided as a city to purchase these lands? We can look into it. This is the first the, request that we receive for that, but we can look into it. The recommend or the the reasoning behind it would be to avoid going into litigation and to offset um, a long term fight and legal battle would be possibly looking in the option of getting an assessed value because submerged lands that's not developable that cannot be developed in this area may have a minimal value that we could possibly purchase. And if we can get an assessed value and a purchase uh, value that makes sense for the city um, to avoid any further litigation, that may be an option for us to look at and say, hey, let's buy this land as a city and own this land, um, which would in the long run cost way less than going into legal, um, a legal battle. And that's just an idea that, I, that has thought about the fact of submerged land that cannot be developed based upon our current code um, but taking this up through the ranks of a litigation lawsuit may in turn cost us more than actually just buying the land outright. Mr. Bauman, well, I think you wanted to comment. Yes, I just wanted to, to point out that you know, I've, I've done a fair amount of this um, previously for Palm Beach County with some of their, their natural lands uh, prior to that for the state of Florida, a little bit even in private practice. And I think what you're what you're going to find here is that the kind of the fork in the road, if you will, uh, on appraised value will be, is it developable? Uh, you know, the, the, some of the property owners in this area have taken the position, of course, that it is developable, that they can develop it uh, currently. And, um, uh, you know, yes, there's costs involved in environmental permitting, mitigation, et cetera, to develop it, but that it has a value that that's figured into so what you're going to wind up with is a 
very likely is you're going to wind up with a very high number on one end for developable waterfront property on Singer Island uh, and a very low number on the other end for undevelopable submerged land. But that's that's definitely where, you know, the the, the fork in the road lies on this issue. Um, so, I'm not saying that it's not worth looking into, but I'm just pointing out that that's likely to be the the, the point of dispute. Well, that was my question. I, I don't want to, I don't want to waste any taxpayers' dollars um, if it's not going to give us a actual concrete answer um, one way or the other. Because essentially, what you're saying is that an appraiser can just determine uh, based upon their opinion if this is developable or not. Um, well, they have to. They have to look at what's what's called the highest and best use of the property. So mm -hmm. they would look at the the city's existing. Uh, regulations, the state's existing regulations, uh, and would, based upon that, try to figure out what the what the the most beneficial, economically beneficial use of the property is, and then appraise it at that. And in this case, you'd probably get a price per square foot, and then calculate it out. Um, okay. And then I guess that that kind of refers back to my original question of. Has there been any comparable land, um, whether special land, uh, special preservation wetlands that has been developed over the last 10 years, and that could be used against us to say that this is essentially a taking, as some of these residents have claimed? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's been the that's been the issue. Is um, in this in this instance, we have a comprehensive plan that's been in place for, you know, what uh, uh, over 20 years. Right. Um, that uh, um, says no. Um, you have uh, one owner uh, at the minimum who essentially through non arms length transactions appears to have owned the property prior to that. And so they occupy one position, uh, if you will, in terms of owning land prior to the change in regulation the regulation itself has a savings clause in it. That owner has a judgment uh, that says that the savings clause is in effect within his property. Then you have another owner uh, who has come in and bought a lot of properties in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, come in with the regulations in his face um, and essentially bought into the problem. Uh, kind of a, a swamp, uh, what, what we what we used to call a swamp peddler scenario, yes. right? And uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I know, yeah. Uh, you know, and sometimes it pays off, and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in terms of whether or not you know <clears throat> one or or either of of these scenarios, you know, plays out that somebody has the right to 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 do something on the property. I can say that it probably, in that, that case, it shows you that it could boil down to a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, and in my mind, it, it, it really plays into what were the regulations when, when, you, when you stepped in and decided to put down money and buy the property? You know, because so that, is, cause that informs what we call your reasonable investment-backed expectation which is one of the tests for whether or not there's a taking. Uh, right. You know, when you came in, if you had all kinds of red flags in the in the, the the laws that apply to the property that say you can't do this, then it's sort of like you know building a a, a luxury resort next to a, a slaughterhouse and then complaining about the slaughterhouse. You know, you came to the nuisance. Right. Um, but in the other so instance, Bindo, if you doesn't that run us into the issue that we do have both uh, forms of landowners that are actually going to be affected? So whether they were there prior or they came in after, we mm -hmm. could be lawsuit from either side based upon the code that we have and that we had in place. Correct. And the, that is why the comprehensive plan has an out in it that says that if the comprehensive plan, and it essentially refers to it's using language that's kind of like takings language. The comprehensive plan in creating this special preservation land use 
um, is says that you know if this is going to impact or or destroy uh, legally vested rights as determined by a court. In other words, if this is going to result in a taking, then this thing isn't going to apply. And so the zoning ordinance, the issue with the zoning ordinance is that the zoning ordinance said something else because it predated the comprehensive plan. It wasn't brought up to speed, but the zoning ordinance similarly is tied to the comprehensive plan because the zoning ordinance says, um, you know, if the comprehensive plans, um, you know, opt out provision applies, then this also doesn't apply because this is implementing that provision. But what you've got is you've got people coming forward, waving, essentially, it's like reading one half of a book. You know, they're, they're showing the, the, the front half of the book, which is the zoning code. Goes, oh, I can do five units per acre. And then you've got the back half of the book that says, oh, wait a second, there's a plot twist here, guys. This comprehensive plan, which trumps it, says something else. And so that's that was the issue when that came up for the city um the city's like you know look people are are now beginning to try to exploit this in some way we have to clean this up but from a legal effect uh the zoning ordinance was written to really not do anything except clean it up the comprehensive plan still applies or doesn't and the zoning ordinance would therefore still apply or not okay okay Perfect. All right, well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, anyone else? Because I have a couple. Ms. Miller Anderson, do you have anything? Okay. Um, Mr. Bauman, so if I purchased property, let's say for want of a better example on Pine Point, and I purchased it knowing that the comprehensive plan of the city of Riviera Beach prohibited any development along Pine Point, thus you know, allowing me to be assured that my line of sight up the Lake Worth Lagoon would be unimpeded. I could sue the city if the city allows development on that submerged land, that special preservation area, because the comprehensive plan that was in effect when I purchased my property would have prohibited that development. Is that right? Um. I guess my question is yes, anybody, yes anybody no. can sue the city. Okay. Yeah, anybody, you know, anybody can sue anybody for anything these days. Right. Uh, right. but right. the two things that you have to remember, of course, is number one, as a as a government entity, you enjoy sovereign immunity. And so from a sovereign immunity standpoint, you have protection for what were always characterized as those uniquely governmental planning decisions, such as granting a permit. Uh, that line of cases actually came um, from a case where an adjacent owner sued it was in that case it was the predecessor of the DEP I believe um, um, for giving his neighbor an environmental permit that he said was going to harm him and in that case they said uh, no that's sovereign immunity uh, that's a uniquely governmental function um, it's not like, uh, um, you know, failing to maintain a traffic signal or, or something like that, where, you know, you've already made the uniquely governmental decision and now you're just negligent in carrying it out, let's say. Now, that being said, the, the different cause of action is the one that we talked about where um, if somebody is granted a development order that conflicts with the comprehensive plan, um, any citizen uh, can essentially uh, sue the city uh, for injunctive and declaratory relief to enforce the comprehensive plan. Comprehensive plans are essentially citizen enforced under the statute. So in your scenario, if someone along the water anywhere in the city determined that um, uh, the city had given his neighbor some kind of a permit that was in violation of the comprehensive plan, um, the, that person could file a lawsuit against the city um, to ask for a declaration that the city's permit is null and void uh, and could ask that uh, the court enjoin the city from honoring that permit, in essence. That has always been the law. 
Um, the the Pine Point scenario that you're that you're referring to, Ms. Botel, is uh, that one's a little bit of a sticky wicket because the the particular preservation district that we're talking about here, as drawn by the comprehensive plan, does not necessarily extend to Pine Point Road. So there's land around it that you know one way or another. But what you're describing is. I would call a general statement of the law. If the government grants a permit that violates the comprehensive plan, any citizen is essentially harmed uh, and can essentially uh, sue to enforce their their local comprehensive plan. Okay. So any of the citizens, for example, that are, have signed a petition in support of this ordinance could, in their minds, because they're being harmed by us, um, not enforcing the ordinance or not enforcing no no that's plan. no they would have to have the they would have to have the government um essentially grant a development permit somewhere along the line so the city right. would have to give somebody something right and then they could okay yes. um the, the uh, one other question i see mr lawson would like to chime in again but let me just ask this so if something happened that we did not pass this ordinance the comprehensive plan doesn't change. The comprehensive plan still prohibits any development in that special preservation area. And the comprehensive plan trumps anything below it. So no one in the building officials department, for example, could give a permit to develop that land, be, whether it's zoned, whatever it's zoned, no one could give a permit to develop that land because the comprehensive plan trumps the permitting process. Am I right? So yes. Yes. Okay. So, yes. So, if, if someone submitted a permit to our department and we sent it through the typical planning review, planning would return it and say that based on a review of the comprehensive plan, we cannot grant this, this permit, um, even if the zoning um, does or does not uh, match up with what they're trying to do. But it, it would not pass through zoning because the comprehensive plan would not allow the development. Okay. It, so it our... wouldn't pass through the zoning department. Right. So our vote on this ordinance is almost a pro forma vote. It's because we have to bring the zoning into compliance with a comprehensive plan. It's not as if anything really changes. It is the comprehensive plan is what rules our actions. And our bringing the zoning into compliance with the comprehensive plan is simply to come in uh, into accordance with what the, what the state requires us to do. Am I right? I want to make sure I'm right. Mr. Yeah, that's what that's what we presented in the in the first reading. That's correct. Right. Mr. Gagnon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, add to the record that there are specific uses that are uh, permitted according to the comprehensive plan, and that would be carried over into the zoning district. So um, I know you're using a general example as far as general development within that special preservation area. Um, however, there are specific uses that are called out, so uh, there are legal uses available for those property owners. Right. And I, as I understand it, that is what we hang our hats on when it comes to uh, anyone claiming that there's a taking, because we're not, we're not prohibiting certain things from happening there. In other words, you could put a little dock to put your kayak on and so on. So we're not completely eliminating your use of your property, so therefore it's not considered a taking. Am I right? somebody, Mr. Gagnon. That's why I want to bring it uh, yes. to everyone's attention that there are uses available and are perhaps uses. Mr. Bauman can expand on that. Right. Okay. I think. Well, and, the, just... and the, the taking is, a, again, it's, it is by definition, a, a court doctrine. So a court, you know, will not make a, a categorical ruling across properties that aren't before it. Um, it's case by case, and the court would have to look at the particular property. So the other thing to bear in mind is that um, you you could have a taking in one case and not have a taking in another case with the same regulation, for example, based upon different physical configurations of the property. It it gets that <clears throat> complicated. Could, you know, Singer Island has a Singer Island Civic Association, and many of the people in that association are uh, supportive of this ordinance. If if the city granted a permit and, and issued a permit for building, the, could the Singer Island Civic Association sue the city? 
in uh, their their standing on, their standing is a little different. Have, what they would likely do is they would name a couple of members who are okay. citizens and residents, and then themselves. But yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lawson. Had I'm sorry, Mr. McCoy. Were you? I couldn't see what you were doing. He's okay. hiding. Go ahead, Mr. Lawson. So just to um, understand your point, uh, Councilman Botel, what you're trying to say is that anybody can sue the city at any time. Well, yes, and and you know I think that's the argument that you were trying to make is let's let's yeah. be careful let's be careful not to be sued, and I agree mm -hmm. we certainly don't want to be sued, but the point is anybody can sue us whether it's right. the certain person who wants to develop the land, uh, or the people who don't want to see the land developed. So it, right. it really so, is. So, we can, uh, so it's going to happen one way or the other. Essentially, and that's the reason I'm saying that whether we um, that land we allow for it to be developed or not developed, essentially someone is going to not be happy with us. So that's why I want all the information brought to the table so that we can understand exactly what decision we need to make as a collective um, and <clears throat> whether whether it's unanimous or whether it's um, majority. And the last thing or last question I just wanted to address with the uh, um, attorney Wynn is in reference to the majority and supermajority because I, I definitely want to bring that to the table because um, I did receive a letter and I want to understand the dynamics of passing and changing this ordinance so that we can be completely educated so that we know exactly how to maneuver how the steps that we can take so that if a lawsuit does come about that we can be prepared and um, not jeopardize the taxpayers dollars. Madam Chair, before she answers, can I ask a question? Because I literally asked the same question of legal, and I was waiting for them to come back with a more comprehensive response. So I was hoping that it probably be best that they can answer that, um, you know, after they spend some time. Because literally, I got, I think we may have gotten all of the letters this evening. I, think we all got this evening. I didn't get one, so maybe you'll have to read it to me. For some reason, I didn't get but one. I, so. but, but I guess, I didn't and, I'm not, and I'm saying oh, this respectfully to, Councilperson Lawson, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I wanted to find out if this is something that Ms. Wynn should probably spend some time looking into first, because I, I literally asked um, the city attorney's office a similar question this afternoon. Yeah, no, I'm, I saw the letter earlier this morning, so I'm prepared to, to address it. Our code says that if 20% or more of the landowners in the areas uh, affected by the change uh, have signed a protest that we have to, this ordinance can only be passed by three fourths of, of the um, city council, which is a four to one vote. The first reading, the ordinance passed on first reading, moving it on to second reading by three to two, a three to two vote. That um, vote of passing it of the first reading does not make the ordinance effective. The ordinance only becomes effective upon adoption and adoption only occurs at the second reading or the public hearing. So we're in a, the posture now where you still can move forward to, to the second reading. You, if, if it had passed four to one or five zero at first reading and never got to second reading, you would not have an effective ordinance because it would not have passed on second reading. So all that's so, required at second reading, a supermajority, three-fourths vote of council is what's required to pass this ordinance. Okay. So Madam Chair, um, being that I believe you said, and uh, Ms. miller said you did not read the letter, um, would you like for that no, to be I, read into the record or? No, that's, a, that's okay. I'll get a copy from Ms. Wynn, thank you. Um, okay. Mr. McCoy, did you have anything else? Because I have a quick question of the attorney. So, Ms. Wynn, when you say 20% of the landowners, is that based on the number of landowners or on the amount of land? Um, and Mr. Gagnon and Mr. Sermons, feel free to jump in. It's the 20% of the area of the lots that are okay. comprised of. And I believe Mr. Gagnon did a calculation earlier today for us, and it was 33%. So the 20% is definitely there. Okay. So Correct. it's all the it's the submerged landowners, is my question. Mr. Gagnon, you can tell us who they are. Yeah, I believe the section that I'm pulling it up now um, it specifically refers to uh, the property owners directly impacted, and it also refers to some of the property owners in close proximity of the impacted area. Uh, in this instance, the directed 
or directly impacted property owners uh, meet the criteria for Section 31-5, which is 20% um, of the area that is being impacted. Right. And yes, yeah, so we did a, an acreage calculation and it's approximately 33%. Okay, thank you. 33% and about half of a, oh, never mind. Because uh, if you base it, I'm sure, on the number of people, it would be quite a different calculation. But uh, Mr. Lawson, did you say you had something else? No, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Miller-Anderson, do you have anything? Who, where were the letters? They were emailed, and by whom? And when? They were, e they were emailed. I'm not sure I have them in front of me. One, I believe, from um, Carrie Barsh on behalf of Mr. Lozman, and one from and attorney Barbara, uh, we, I'll have, Ms. Busby will send those to you tonight. Okay, thank you. I don't have yeah, any other Richard, questions. Yeah, Richard Barber, Barbara, Barbara okay. also. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Um, anything from you, Mr. McCoy? No. Mr. Lawson, do you have all the information you need to make your determination? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I still am waiting on information because I believe Mr. Gagnon and Mr. Sermons said that they would get back with me with some questions. Um, I'm assuming by the next uh, meeting or prior to the next reading. And just so I'm sure what they what so that I'm sure they know what that those questions are. Could you just repeat? I believe them? I believe they know what they those questions are, Madam Chair. Mr. Gagnon, do you know what the questions are? Uh, yes, I believe uh, Vice Chair Lawson requested additional information pertaining to uh, any other development of environmentally sensitive areas, uh, specifically within the uh, City Marina area, uh, as well as uh, the Harbor Ooh. Point project, which is east of um, the city's fire station. Um, those are the the two talking points that I can recall. I know Mr. Serbins. Um, yeah, I think on those, I think those, that particular point we did address it and the difference between those and the lands in question is, are, are those were not uh, considered a special mm -hmm. preservation uh, a future land use uh, area. Um, so I think we answered that question already, but I do have, well, I have the zoning uh, map and the future land use map been misaligned for so long and the second one is what is the value of the lands in question? Uh, those are the two uh, still standing questions that I have. Is that correct, Mr. Lawson? Yes, Mr. Bowman answered the question about the values as well. So, okay, but that that, that reflects that reflects my notes as well, Mr. Sermons, on the vice chair's uh, questions. Was why had the problem uh, uh, sat so long, and why now? And then uh, the question of um, valuation, which I believe uh, staff uh, said that they could look into it. And then the last one was uh, impact to environmentally uh, sensitive lands in the last 10 years. That's what my notes are reflecting. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, so we will be discussing this again when, Ms. Wynn, when's the second reading? Uh, September, I don't have my calendar in front of me. Is it um, I don't know if staff has additional work to do or in response to Mr. Lawson's questions or if they have a date. It's That's set by Development Services. Okay. Sure. And sure. I guess I, I have, sorry. Currently sorry. it is slated for September 2nd. Um, I don't foresee we need to push the meeting back to uh, dig more into the history of the uh, disparity between uh, the future land use map and the zoning map. Um, so uh, at the, the uh, current moment, I would foresee us uh, doing, continuing with the second reading on November 2nd. Thank you. Mr. McCoy. Okay. <clears throat> I think he said November. Right. Oh, yeah, you mean September, correct, Mr. September. Sermon? I beg your pardon. It's funny. He said November. I wrote September. <laughs> so I don't know. I guess I, <laughs> I, I'm not sure I agree with that because, you know, I, I think I shared with Ms. Wynn, you know, members, as much as I want to be committed to coming to every single meeting and taking care of our duty, like we have to be cognizant of our 
our particular calendars. Next week we have four meetings in um out of four of those meetings, three of those days I'm out of the um I won't be in town. So I'm literally logging in. But I mean to automatically declare that we're gonna do it on the second, I mean the the problem I have with that is like obviously there's gonna be a notice requirement. Then that essentially is the first meeting in September, right? That's our first regularly scheduled meeting. And I don't wanna be in a meeting until midnight to deal with this with this item. You know, so I think there has to be more planning and it needs to work around the existing schedule that we have with the CRA, also with the city, especially because we're in constant budget discussions on both sides. And obviously we're gonna have the same with USD. So, you know, this is becoming where we almost see each other every night. Mr. Sherman, I'm sorry, Mr. McCoy. Have, have we uh, advertised this for the second already? We've been working with the city clerk's office, and I believe that notice is already out. Um, we we okay. already we already have a city council meeting scheduled for the second, right? I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. McCoy. What's your, what's your objection that you wanted to cancel the city council meeting? Well, I, I I'm just hoping that there is some uh, coordination because you know, are we going to have a regular scheduled city council meeting, or are we going to, I guess, yeah. push back our regular scheduled meeting? until the third Wednesday. So that's kind of my question. I, I think we have a regularly scheduled city council meeting on which, on which agenda this item will appear, Madam Clerk. Madam Chair, members of the board, September 2nd is your regular scheduled um, city council meeting. However, if you all recall, we will also have a meeting on September 8th um, as it relates to the first reading of the um, budget ordinances. So I don't know if that's what Mr. Um, McCoy may be referring to as to the number of meetings that are scheduled. Well, we do have a lot of meetings, but this one was this one is a regularly scheduled city council meeting. So this is just going to be another item on that agenda. Well, I, I mean, is that really the case? Can you say that? Because I guess my concern was we had the first reading on a meeting all by itself because the voluminous amount of comments. So oh, are we I suggesting that we're going to have a regular scheduled meeting then have this ordinance included in that meeting i just don't want to spend all night i know on, I, on, on item. I know i appreciate that and i don't either but my understanding from people with whom i've spoken on the island is that they consolidated their public comments into a petition so that their public comments don't have to individually be read and they did this on their of their own volition uh, so that they will just have their names read am i right miss Wynn? did we clarify that their names are going to be read i don't know if you or maybe the clerk has that information so that we don't have to listen to every single public comment written read out in full but rather just the list of names and i think they're almost up to a thousand names at this point so it will take a little bit of time to read the names but it certainly won't take the several hours worth of reading of public comments that it would normally take so i think that uh, the preference of people with whom i've spoken who are directly impacted by this ordinance would like to have it done as soon as possible. Lina Busby is just texting me something. Ms. Anthony, can you please oh, speak no, to the public there. comment? I don't know what, how many we received thus far, if you received the petition or not. The Office of the City Clerk has not, my apologies, Madam Chair, members of the board, the Office of the City Clerk has not received anything in regards to that matter. I believe there was um, an inquiry done by a resident regarding that, whether or not that could be done. And Ms. Wynn did address that um, person. However, we have not received anything in our office as of to date. Right, but, my, but I think the question was, have they, are they being allowed to have the names of the people who signed the petition read? And the answer is yes, I think, yes. So that, so they won't be reading individual uh, letters uh, uh, addressing this issue. They'll just be reading the names of the people who are in support of the petition. Unless people yes. submit individually, oh, well, and those oh, will no, be read as well. Yes. Oh, absolutely, right. But, but, but people who signed the petition will have their names read. So that will eliminate the, the voluminous nature of the past meetings public comments section. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get it done on the on the on the uh, ninth on the second uh, of September. Okay, that's fine, Madam Chair. I, you know, 
if, if that's what we need to do, if that's what they want to advertise, I would just, I guess we can, I, I'm sure the manager will be briefed on our sentiments about, I'm brief, he knows exactly, you know, our concerns with the number of meetings across the board. So if the city council has regular business that is going to be, uh, I guess, um, more than usual, then we'll call a special meeting again to handle the regular city business that we would normally take care of on uh, right. on the first first Wednesday of the month. So, but that's fine. I certainly understand the uh, the need to want to um, kind of move this item forward. So, thank Ms. you, Buzz. Thank you, Ms. Buzz. Good evening, Chair Botel and members of the City Council. Um, Chair Botel, I just about five minutes ago emailed you and uh, Councilpersons Miller Anderson and Councilperson Lanier the requested letters. So I just wanted to confirm that you received that by email. I did. I, I wasn't sure what you were emailing and I just picked it up and saw that you were sending me that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So just one last question time and I'll just ask Mr. Uh, Bauman or actually I'll ask the attorney this. So if we do not pass this ordinance, what is the consequence to the city from a from a state mandate you know point of view? We we are we are required to make our zoning come into compliance with a comprehensive plan. What happens if this doesn't pass? If the practical effect is that we're in the same position will be in the same position that we're in right now where they won't be consistent. I don't believe, Mr. Bauman, do you, is there a penalty associated with that from the state? Um, the, now it was Department of Community Affairs, uh, was it uh, Department of Economic Opportunity um, can um, uh, essentially bring, levy some sort of enforcement um, action, if you will, which is essentially they they'll start, you know, bugging you with correspondence and and uh, um, raising threats and whatnot about correcting something if it if it comes to their attention. That's okay. correct. So, um, or at some point, uh, the city will go in for its um, for an amendment to its comprehensive plan, and this could get raised at, at some point. Okay. Which is ironically how this this provision in the comprehensive plan came about in the first place. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So in the, in the meantime, if, if we were not to pass this, nothing changes with regard to development. Nothing can be developed because the comprehensive plan prohibits it, right? Unless the savings clause in that um, uh, comprehensive plan provision applies to a particular property owner, then um, the comprehensive plan places limitations on what people can do on the property. They're, the properties are not, um, right. quote, undevelopable. Uh, right. Could you put a house on it? Probably not. Right, okay. You can put a but little, there, are little things, there are things that can be built on it. Okay, what about legal fees? If, if the, and I, I get back to my question about the Singer Island Civic Association. If the, Civic, if the Singer Island Civic Association were to sue the city and they win, do we have to pay their legal fees? Uh, yes, that is traditionally a, a, a provision that's been in um, uh, Chapter 163, 3215, that if a citizen initiated um, comp plan enforcement case is brought and the citizens win, they get their attorney's fees. That statute, uh, be mindful, was amended um, last year or the year before. Um, to actually make that reciprocal. So that is a new, um, that is a new wrinkle to the, um, to the, the uh, 163, 32, 15, which is a reference to the statute, um, comprehensive plan lawsuit, is that if the government agency wins, they are entitled to their attorney's fees. Okay. Uh, the idea was to try to tamp down um, you know, frivolous or, or ill-advised lawsuits that sort of are aimed at harassing governments. Okay. To save it for the good ones, in other words. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Sermons? Um, from a staff perspective, uh, we do deal with the issue on a, an applicant level, and, and there's ambiguity um, when the zoning code says one thing and the comprehensive plan uh, says another. 
Um, so that consistency really helps staff uh, when we are explaining to someone why they uh, cannot develop. Um, because when this code says, this map says one, and this map says the other. So if we're not willing to make the zoning code consistent uh, with the future land use map, then we should also probably determine that we don't want that future land use there if we're not going to make the documents consistent. But e either way, um, it helps staff when we have um, all of our documents lined up and we have to deal with these property owners um, on an individual basis. So um, the consistency is not only mandated by state, but it also helps us um, making sure there's clarity um, when we are um, enforcing city regulations. Okay, thank you. Anything else before we, Mr. Lawson? Madam Chair, just um, a question in reference to the the fencing that was placed on um, Pine Point. I'm not sure if it's Mr. Sermon, Mr. Gagnon, or Ms. Wynn. Was that fence legally um, allowed to be put there? Because I know some residents on Pine Point have expressed concern with that, that fence being placed. So can you give me an update on why that fence was there? and? If it was not there, how quickly can that be taken down? And what would the steps be needed? Right, but that, I'm sorry, can I ask, but isn't that a question that would kind of seem to be more appropriate to be taken offline? Because aren't, isn't there currently some uh, code enforcement magistrate, I guess, litigation, if you will? Um, yes. That I think would probably potentially compromise. I, I just don't see that that's a benefit to ask that question at this point, um, Mr. Lawson. And I mean, uh, if you... I uh, well, Councilman, Councilman McCoy, I didn't know that there was litigation, so I guess that would be something that I, I know there was an issue, but if they, if either our attorney or Mr. Sermons could let me know or let the council know that there is a litigation going on and let the council know that we can take that offline, because um, I guess I didn't, I didn't have that information. Ms. Wynn? A citation has been issued. There is a code case, and it's the city's position that the fence should not have been placed on the property, which is why we cited them. Thank you. So, so based on Councilman McCoy's statement that we're currently um, with the magistrate, and I guess that we're currently just going through the steps of figuring out what's going to be done next. Right. right. Okay. Thank you uh, for the updates. Okay. Uh, this was a workshop, so we don't have any comments from city attorney or council. If there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.